Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here at CSIS. We're going to be hosting a fireside chat with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the CDC director, to really focus in on CDC's preparedness and the road ahead. I'm Julie Gerberding, and I serve as the CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I'm also co-chairing with my colleague, former Congresswoman Susan Brooks, the CSI Commission on Strengthening America's Health Security. I also served as the CDC director from 2002 to 2009, so you can imagine this topic is pretty near to my heart. I'm delighted to be hosting Dr. Walensky here today. Um, she's been the CDC director since 2021, but I bet it feels a bit longer than that. <laughs> Um, before her tenure in government, she was the Chief of Infectious Diseases at the Massachusetts General Hospital, a professor at Harvard, and has an amazing track record of contributing not only to the events in the COVID pandemic there, but also a long history of contributions to combating HIV AIDS on the front lines, as well as a few other infectious diseases that emerge from time to time. So we're absolutely delighted to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here and thank you to CSIS for hosting us. Thank, thank you. you. I'm also happy to be here with my colleague, Dr. Tom Inglesby. Tom is a member of our commission and has been a consistent and remarkable contributor for a long time, but he also is the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, and he has an, a, a very astonishing track record of contribution, particularly in the science of public health preparedness and the actual translation of that science into operational planning and response. He is co-chairing with Steve Morrison a work group here at the Commission on the future of CDC and CDC preparedness. So uh, welcome, Tom, and thank you very much for joining us. Great to be here. I think it would be fair to say that we're at a pivotal moment in the CDC's future. Um, on the one hand, I know, and I think anyone who's watching closely recognizes that the CDC has had a tremendous impact on the course of this pandemic and has done a spectacular job in many dimensions. But they're also showing signs of strain. Um, they've faced many challenges in public. The scientific rigor has been challenged. The communication competency and capacity has been challenged. And I think um, the political assaults have really intensified. So it's been a really tough time. When I was the CDC director, we faced some similar challenges. But what was different then, at least from my point of view, is that the context in which these challenges were experienced and adjudicated was much different. We're operating in an exceptionally partisan environment, but we're also operating in a world that is filled with external challenges, disruptions, and other major issues besides a pandemic. We have a citizenry that's frightened, um, that's sometimes confused, and really is not able to tolerate the kind of ambiguity and uncertainty that a chronic pandemic has created for them. So it's really eroded the trust in all of the institutions, and clearly CDC is no exception. I think we want and believe that CDC remains the gold standard of public health expertise, not just here in the United States, but I think around the world, and probably more conspicuously globally um, today um, than ever. But we also know that CDC does need to change, and that's really kind of what we hope to address here. Dr. Walensky has come forward with some agenda for reform at the CDC. She's already gotten started. There are things underway. Um, we're anticipating the adoption of more modern tools, further development of the workforce, and hopefully sustained investment so that the agency can really move ahead and not have the um, crisis to complacency funding that we've experienced in the past. So Tom, maybe you'd like to add your two cents worth before we really get into the meat of our discussion, because be I know you've been watching this from the same place uh, I've been watching it, from afar, yes, thankfully. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed, and thank you, Julie, and uh, it's great to be with you, Rochelle, and thank you for all that you've been doing. This, I absolutely agree, this is a pivotal time for public health in America, and particularly for CDC, and it's a time where we should be doing all that we can to strengthen public health preparedness and CDC's work to secure its own future and for the country. We all know how important it is to do this in a bipartisan way and that we will only make progress if we have the support of the administration and Congress. And we also know how important 
concrete, actionable steps will be for forward progress in the time ahead. And so we really appreciate, Rochelle, you coming to join us for this, uh, this discussion. And uh, earlier this month, uh, you announced the results of your own internal review process. And um, you laid out plans for the agency's future and your reform agenda. And we have seen that these efforts are already beginning to take place. We here at this commission and in this working group are reflecting on similar issues and eager to learn more from you today and to hear about your plans for the future. We have a lot of ground to cover this afternoon, so uh, we want to get right into it and make this a kind of an informal interaction with you, and uh, we're, we're really eager to do that. We also have a small group of experts on our, on our commission who are here with us today who we will turn to for input and questions towards later, later in the conversation. So with that, let me turn back to you to get us going, Julie. Thank you. You know, I'm just sitting here realizing that probably a lot of people don't really understand what CDC is and what its broad mission really um, includes. Our focus right now has been sort of on the urgent emergency preparedness part of the CDC's responsibility, but actually it has a very important and a much broader agenda. So maybe you could just start us off by the fundamentals. What is yeah. the CDC and what is its mission? <laughs> Great, thank you. And again, delighted to be with all of you. Um, CDC is a public health agency, and public health means caring for everybody. So that is what we do. We um, are charged to work 24-7 to um, protect the health and security and safety of all Americans, whether those threats come from domestic threats or from abroad. Um, the, we're an agency of about 12,000, 13,000 people. Um, and I think that those people are our biggest asset. Um, and they really have been incredible. Um, as you know, CDC, you know, became, you know, part of dinner table conversation through a pandemic. But the work that we do there, I think, is not really recognized as what we do beyond the pandemic. So I can tell you that um, Victoria Shu repelled out of a helicopter as an EIS officer to deliver test kits to the Diamond Princess. And um, uh, Alex Hoffmaster, um, led a team on outbreak investigation of milioidosis, which I'm certain many people have not heard of, um, when it started to strike in numerous disparate states, um, and it is generally endemic in a world away, and he found the source. Um, his team found the source. Um, we had 63 foodborne outbreaks in 2021 that most people didn't hear about, but that we were charged with addressing. Um, we deployed 400 people um, to five different countries to address um, uh, Marburg hemorrhagic fever in Uganda and CDC's polio effort in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan um, and you know numerous COVID outbreaks around the world so there's there's so and then of course that's many of the infectious threats but the non-infectious threats are a really key um, component of what we do as we think about COVID-19 um, we think about it as an infectious threat but the people who were most impacted by COVID-19 had in fact many non-infectious comorbidities. Um, so as we think about mental health, environmental health, um, uh, uh, opioid crises, and then of course chronic conditions, chronic heart disease and obesity. So um, we do have a wide, vast menu of things that we are tackling. In the news, you're going to hear about COVID and monkeypox and polio. Um, but what we do every day, our subject matter expertise does every day, is what leverages our ability to do that. And in fact, we know so much about monkeypox um, because we have decades of work going on within the CDC about monkeypox specifically. Now, when I see Dr. Besser here in the audience, Dr. Rich Besser um, led our uh, Center for Emergency Preparedness and Response when I was at the CDC and we went deep on preparedness in terms of planning and exercising and investing and so forth. But I think um, looking back on it, we thought of it as a health crisis and we approached it as a health crisis. We concentrated on the medical and the public health dimensions of it. We didn't think so much about the economic crisis mm -hmm. And we didn't think so much about the social consequences and the inequities that were part of um, what we're experiencing right now in the context of this pandemic. What that really says to me is it's a whole of government 
um, responsibility. And so I guess part of the issue is how does CDC fit into this much broader governmental context and how do you negotiate your unique role and yet at the same time um, participate in the intra-agency process? Yeah, I, that I think has been something that I had to learn quickly and is so key because we, we will say we lead with science and we do lead with science. But as we make policies, we can't ignore the fact that these are interagency policies. So how does our school guidance intersect with the plans of Department of Education? How does our um, infection control and prevention guidance intersect with what labor is doing, Department of Labor is doing? How does the eviction moratorium um, intersect with um, housing and urban development? And so almost every decision that we have made in the context of a pandemic, in, in the, of the pandemic, in, the, in, in our guidance, in our decision making, has brought, and those are just you know, several brief examples, has brought interagency collaboration, um, important policy intersections that we have to take into account as we're making these, you know, these guidances and recommendations. Yeah, so Rochelle, just uh, picking up on what you said a little earlier about your deployments overseas, I've heard you say before that uh, when an infectious disease crisis hits many parts of the world, the first call people make is to CDC. You want to say any more about your international work that you're doing? Yeah, I, I think that actually people recognize CDC for its domestic work, um, but I think it, I, I had my first opportunity to go abroad, and we've had a, a lot of work happening domestically, so I haven't been able to go as broad as much as I would have liked, but I had my first opportunity to go abroad, and it has been, and I've been doing outreach to our 60 country directors. We have a presence in 60 countries, um, and truly, um, Meetings don't start in many of these countries without, administer of health meetings don't start unless CDC is at the table to provide that advice. When, when there's a minister of health who is giving advice to a government, they want CDC at their side to give that technical support. We do an incredible amount of work in the training of um, the public health leaders, the epidemiologists, the laboratorians, um, the, the disease detectives in these international sites. Um, in Uganda, I, I got to see you know, a staff of 160 that um, were called to do a leptospirosis outbreak um, investigation. So I think that the, here in the United States, it's underappreciated how important it is, um, our domestic, our international footprint. And of course, you know, we now know that no one is safe until everyone is safe, right? And so a, an international threat very much is one that could, you know, from a global health security standpoint, be a domestic threat. And and I am particularly proud of the incredible work that we do internationally. I, I try and stay in touch with our international offices, to our uh, country offices, to make sure that they know that headquarters is with them. And, and Rochelle, you noted a minute ago that people may not know about the international work. Are there other things about CDC misperceptions or things that you see every day that the American public may not see, things that you're particularly excited about or you know, I think, I think the science of the agency is really, it, it's just incredible. And, and there have been, it, when I started, and I started really learning, and, and mind you, I am an, I, before I got here, I was an avid consumer of CDC. Like, I knew more than the average person about the CDC. And yet, when I got to the CDC and I started really doing a tour of all the divisions and, and centers and the work that they were doing, there, it was a bit of a kid in a candy store. We do that here? Um, vital statistics. and and environmental justice and um, you know cardiovascular disease I of course knew about but the deep subject matter expertise that you know when there was this first case of monkeypox I could talk to somebody who's literally had spent decades of her career as a, you know working in monkeypox um, and that is true for name the infectious disease and I will say this meliodosis case that I sort of brought up I, I was the first person to say gosh I don't know if they're ever going to find where this came from um, and sure enough they did so um, that is the incredible work of the people every single day and mind you we will never know their names. I gave you their names, but um, they are not doing it for credit. They're not doing it for, for recognition. They're doing it because they believe in protecting our health and safety and security. So can, can we keep going in that direction around the work that CDC is doing 
for epidemic preparedness and response, pandemic preparedness and response. I mean, obviously in this pandemic, many things have been happening and when things don't work, they may be called out, but they're not always called out when things are working. And so can you say a little bit more about the things at CDC where you think, even as you're looking at your reform agenda and what you're thinking about changing, where do you think CDC's biggest strengths are, their assets are? Um, yeah, maybe I'll talk, first, I think we should just acknowledge that in the last 19 months, we have delivered 600 million vaccines to Americans. That's kind of extraordinary with a vaccine safety and effectiveness profile that has been rigorously studied from moms and babies and infants. Um, so that, that in and of itself is something that I think is underappreciated, what it took to vaccinate, we can call it 75% of America. Um, so, so that I think is something we should acknowledge. In terms of the work that we're doing and have been doing, um, there have been numerous things when I came, um, when I started as an um, as a admirer of CDC from the outside, I could also say that these were challenges that I perceived as the outside. Our science needed to move faster. Um, CDC had been long criticized for our science not moving fast enough. So how can we get things out faster, our clearance process out faster? That was something I addressed early on. Equity, clearly a challenge in the pandemic. Um, and this was something that I know that all of CDC actually believed in, but we had this moment to do more for health equity. And, and actually it was one of the things that worked to boost the morale most of the agency when I got there was to talk about equity, to mobilize around social determinants of health, around a core strategy for equity, around addressing diversity and inclusion within the agency and outside of it. Um, data. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a data geek, <laughs> so data has always been important to me. We launched the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics, which was really important to think about innovation, data sources, how we can um, project, how we can forecast, how we can work with our partners, what do they need in terms of forecasting, and I'm really excited about this new, this new center. Also in data, um, you know, I, I don't know that everybody recognized in, in um, as an infectious disease doc, when you report something to the CDC, it was a handwritten form that you send and say, this patient has measles or this patient has tuberculosis. In COVID, it was a million a day. <laughs> we were getting reports to the tune of a million a day. And some of them were literally coming in by fax machine. That's not a data system. And so we really went from case reporting of 187 uh, places to 15,000 healthcare facilities that we're now reporting data electronically. So we've really scaled up our data systems. And then maybe one final, because Julie you mentioned communications, and that is, um, I started and we had a communications um, director position that had been opened and vacant for f four years. Um, we posted it twice. We've just had that hire um, in the last couple of months. Kevin Griffiths, I'm really excited, is now with us. Um, but that's been challenging. There's no question. So, you know, you're mentioning this data um, systems problem, but a lot of people don't really understand what your authorities are from the state and local level. And I think it's really worth emphasizing that um, you get data by being a good partner, but you don't really have the authority to require it. No, and I think, thank you. So there are two major challenges I would say with data right now. One is the pipes don't connect. Like w data coming in from one state or even one county doesn't connect to its own state, doesn't connect to CDC. Um, and even if it did from that singular state, it doesn't match the pipes from a different state. So if you were, if one jurisdiction was to send data to us, we can't send a similar jurisdiction back to see how they're doing comparatively. That's problem number one. Problem number two is even if all the pipes connected, there's nothing flowing through it. Um, and so through, you know, having come in in the middle of the pandemic when we had the public health emergency, um, many of those systems started coming in because through the public health emergency, we got some of the authorities for the data to come in. But you are exactly right. We do not have the capacity to compel data to come in. Um, we get it voluntarily. Um, we did not get it from monkeypox. We are just now able to get vaccine data from jurisdictions through 64 
legal teams working on data use agreements each time so that we can get those data in and they're now just starting to flow. Um, we can't make real live nimble decisions when three months after you know, a first case we are first starting to see data. So it's both of those issues. We can work on the systems issue. We need the authorities issue. And, we need the partnerships because I really do want to say what I'm not interested in is mandating data from, from jurisdictions. What I'm interested in is a bi-directional highway where if data were to come in, we have a responsibility to give it back in a way that's helpful to the jurisdictions as well. And I, I think that's tough because it's a, um, as you said, the pipes don't match up and just linking one um, institution's healthcare institution's data to their local public health department is a huge challenge, let alone trying to construct such a system for the entire country. But the idea of a data commons in public health is, I think, an idea whose it's time critically has come. Yeah, yeah. It's, and we're actively working on it. Yeah, it's, it's really important, and, and we need Congress, congressional help with yes, that. Yes, we do. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Um, that kind of leads us to the topic of the reform agenda. And you know, I think many people are already familiar with the basic um, framework of, of the reform agenda. Maybe you could just highlight what you've already done, because I know that you didn't wait around for you know, time to pass, you got started right. right away. So we did, we did a lot of work on the data side, we did a lot of work on the equity side, we've done a lot of work on the communication side. Um, we've done a lot of work on the laboratory side too. Um, so clearly laboratory has been a challenge, we've read that in the news. Um, and so one of the first thing that we did when I came in was to do, to do a sort of a deep dive and try and understand, but also to have our advisory committee of the director reconvene. We had lost our advisory committee to the director, so reconvene and our, one of our first work groups is on lab. Um, also a lot of work on quality assurance um, in lab. Our laboratory, um, our office of laboratory science, um, our director had stepped down, so we needed to um, have a replacement, but also Jim Perkle is serving in that role, um, which I'm delighted about, and really do a lot of work on quality assurance. Um, and then importantly, and, and this really will get to the core public health capabilities. We need to raise our core public health capabilities. Laboratory has to be one of them. Um, they had been sort of in layers of hierarchy within the agency and not necessarily it, you know, at the top, raising to the, rising to the top. So laboratory, I think, is really important, really key. We also, from a laboratory standpoint, I will say, um, have developed an um, infectious disease laboratory task force, no test will leave the agency now without um, triplicate review. Um, so that is something that is, is now in place. So in terms of the core public health infrastructure, laboratory, data, and workforce. And, and what I really believe is I certainly wouldn't have imagined in 2022, in addition to COVID, I would be dealing with a national monkeypox challenge. Um, I don't think any, if you, if you could have predicted it, <laughs> would, um, but you know, what I think we it really does say is we need a nimble workforce that knows how to deal with public health challenges, whatever they may be, because we don't know what tomorrow's are. So if we have a workforce a laboratory system and a data system that is really strong and really elevated as our core capabilities, then whatever the subject matter that is the challenge, we will be prepared to tackle it. You know, it, it's, it's um, a lot to do it, at CDC and, and looking at it from a headquarters point of view, but I think our commission and, and many of us believe that it's a broader systems issue than just the CDC and that our state and local health departments, which are so critical to the front line, um, have the same challenges. They need data, they need competent workforce, they need um, resources and a, a, a whole lot of other things. Um, and we could say the same thing about our schools of public health, for that matter. These are generally among the poorest funded and resource components of most universities, and yet um, arguably they're the front line of creating better health protection for everyone, but we don't treat them like they're valuable treasures and resources. So in your, in your reform of the CDC, how are you thinking about 
the responsibility and the advocacy for the rest of the system. Yeah, I think that this is really key. I, you know, I was really energized when after we declared racism a serious public health threat, there were 200 other areas of public health, departments of public health, that either followed suit or were motivated, or motivated and were working in that direction also. I have since also heard that states' departments of public health are actually looking at a review of what went well, what didn't go so well in the last year and a half. But to your point about workforce, um, I think the De Beaumont Foundation did a, did a um, review and, and estimated that our public health workforce is about 80,000 in deficit which is um, truly extraordinary when you think of the work that we have to do. These are folks that often left public health. We, had, we have a lot of folks who were retiring, people who have retired, stuck it through the pandemic, really wanted to do their best. Um, but also folks who are realizing like this has been a, um, a hard job, it's been a divisive job, many have been threatened, and so people have left. Um, what the good news is, is that the public health schools, the applications are up. Med schools, applications are up. People are interested in leaning into this moment. I am an HIV researcher because of when I trained. That is what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that there is, there is, this is a time where we can energize people towards this field, but we do need the infrastructure. We do need the support from Congress, from a bipartisan Congress to say that these are valued, um, revered positions because you're helping others. Yeah, thank you for that. So, Rochelle, in terms of the workforce, you've, you've mentioned this before, talked about the um, very high importance of having a prepared workforce that can respond to the emergencies in front of it. What does that look like at CDC? I mean, I think maybe people don't know how challenging it is to for people to divert from their day jobs and be deployed to overseas for an Ebola crisis or you know, in the field in the United States. What would it take to get that workforce where it needs to be and how do we do that? Yeah, that's actually a really important point. So 12,000 people in CDC and what um, I don't think many people know is we, during most of our pandemic response, we had 2,500 who were deployed to our response. So that's like 25% of the agency at any given time was working in our response. Um, that means two things. One, that they had to agree to be deployed. And two is whatever work they were doing was actually, it didn't stop the you know, food board outbreaks and, and nothing else stopped because they were deployed in the response. And so um, what we have to do, I think, as an agency is make sure that if there is a role for everybody in our agency in the response. I, I've been doing, I, I call them unsung heroes calls, and I just call people who, who maybe haven't been seen or heard as to the work they're doing, but somebody um, booked all of the flights for people to deploy to Operations Allies Welcome up all night, booking flights all night long. Um, there, that person was deployed, right? Um, so we need all levels of expertise. Um, and so, and, and we have that at CDC, but we don't have everybody trained in order to do that every single day. And we don't have an incentive structure in the agency that says, you, um, you're, you're celebrated because you deploy. Um, and that's actually a lot of the work that I think we need to do is to set up that incentive structure um, to be able to say, you know, extra something <laughs> if by deploying, whatever it is, factors towards promotion, whatever those may be, because right now it does feel like you're abandoning your home, your home work if you agree to deploy. That's a challenge. You know, th there is a difference between deployment and embedding. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so deployment, as there's a crisis, let's send some people there to help um, help deal with the problem. Uh, the other complementary model is embedding where people are permanently uh, detailed to serve in a public health department at a local level or a state level or an international setting. 
Um, and there have been several reports and commentaries on the CDC recently that have called for much more embedding to move the, 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 the workforce closer to the front lines of public health. Is that part of the reform that you envision? I think it's going to take resources and people and, and um, mechanism by which we do it, but I do completely agree, and they're not mutually exclusive to be clear. Um, I do completely agree that by working in a state or a local department of public health, you understand the local challenges. You understand how, how some decision that may come from CDC results in some big old challenge that happens locally. And that, so much of what we need to do, and I've said this as part of our review, is partnership. And that means being a good partner and listening as much as, you know, it, again, the bi-directionality here. We are only as good as our effector arms and we can only help them as much as they can provide us information as well. And, you know, the first monkeypox case did not, you know, was not found by somebody at CDC. It was found by somebody um, in a, you know, local jurisdiction who was reported to the local Department of Public Health. That's how it comes in. So we really have to be amazing partners here. Well, I must just say, I, I admire your candor and your courage as you take this on. And, um, it, you know, just even being able to step forward and say, guess what, we didn't do everything right and we have a responsibility to fix it takes a lot of, of leadership, confidence and courage. But I also know um, firsthand that it's very difficult to do and yeah. I'm sure that you are already experiencing some bumps in the road. How do you get help? Who are you going to turn to to help you carry this, this banner forward? And, and how can the commission help you? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I think, um, Thank you for that. I will say I, I have had a lot of support to do this. I think I, I, for, for the time I'm in this position, my job is to better public health in the country. Um, and I think we saw some challenges over the last year and a half, two and a half years. And so my job is to make get it to a better place. Um, some of the challenges, you know, CDC wasn't set up for a pandemic. Um, it wasn't necessarily set up for some, some infectious that threat that would touch 330 million Americans, literally. We think you know about 95% of us have gotten COVID already. So, um, and, and of course, globally, right? So what are the things that we need to do having learned this lesson hard? What are the things that we need to do? I do think that, um, I, and, and so I've had a lot of individual support. The agency, I think, wants to, they, people in the agency read the headlines too. They want to be in a good place. They want us to, to be in a better place. Um, bipartisan congressional support, there, is, um, there are a lot of things that I can do within the agency and that, that ways that I can, that this review shed a light on things that we could improve upon or ways that we can change, um, incentive structures that can be set up so things are better. Um, there are many things that have made it so that we can't be nimble. And data authorities are among them, as you talked about. Um, human resource authorities. We don't have the capacity. We're not permitted to hire and, you know, hire the way FEMA does, to draw in resources the way FEMA does. Con contractual authorities. Um, even in a pandemic, how quickly can we move? Do we have to compete this contract? It's going to take three months to compete this contract. What if we needed a contract in New York City to combat polio education? Do we really need to wait three months for that contract? So, um, and, and then Paperwork Reduction Act, how can, we, how can we get data faster and do studies faster before the public health emergency is declared? So there are numerous areas that would, from a bipartisan standpoint, would really allow us to be more nimble. Um, I will do all the work that I can from inside the agency and, and you know, ask for a little bit of grace and time. We're making these changes. They, some of these challenges didn't happen overnight. The, the you know, changes are not going to happen overnight either. Um, but also to say that there are a lot of different ways as I look at the bigger structure um, outside of CDC at an interagency level that, that things could be, we could be more nimble. You know, Tom, I know you've been thinking a lot about this from the standpoint of the work group. Um, when you look at all of these reports that have already been um, disseminated and you know you must feel like you're getting a lot of advice <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what, what 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 are the things that you're most interested in focusing on well I think uh, uh, it's 
exciting to hear about, and you, maybe you could say a little bit more about this, Rochelle, your interest in changing culture and incentives uh, to try and align with what America's expectations for CDC or your expectations. So it'd be great to hear a little bit more about that. And the other thing that I've heard you say, which I think is really important, we've heard lawmakers from Capitol Hill talk, some of them have said, we really need more accountability. You've said the same thing in your, um, in your talk about reform. Maybe you could say a little bit about what you're thinking about accountability. What does that mean in this case? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Um, yeah, you know, when I think about the incentive structures, um, we have traditionally been um, an academic-like agency. We talk to academicians, we talk to public health officials, we talk to scientists and like-minded people. And over the last two and a half years, we've learned we need to talk to the American people. Um, and so we need to be action oriented and our science needs to be action oriented. So if our, you know, uh, uh, one would be promoted for um, a publication or for their publication productivity, how do we promote people for their public health action? How do we promote people not because that publication made it to the New England Journal, but because that publication led to something implementable on the ground that changed practice, um, even if it was in some lesser tier journal because it was really important from a public health. So it's really the, the, aligning, the aligning the incentives um, so that we now communicate with the American public um, in things that are not sort of esoteric and, and weedy, but sort of that the American public can understand. Um, and then also aligning our incentives towards action, towards deployment, towards embedding, towards um, other things that like lead to, lead to and, and in fact, sometimes when we implement, we have to implement um, differently in different places. And how do you learn that what you implement in frontier America is gonna be different than what you implement in inner city America? And you do that probably by embedding, right? Or by deploying to those areas to see what the cult what's culturally sensitive and needed. You know, one of the challenges that I think is implicit in some of these um, local public health efforts and the communication um, challenges is the fact that we're working in a society that doesn't have high scientific literacy and certainly doesn't have high health literacy. And we don't need to recap all of the issues around social media, misinformation, disinformation. But, you know, that is a root cause of many of the challenges that you're facing and getting the uptake of the guidance and the recommendations. Um, and, and then layered into that, of course, is the political um, divide that sometimes amplifies that. Is that part of your communication plan? It is, and I think if you look at, about two weeks ago, we, we released updated COVID-19 guidance. Um, one of them was a school guidance, and I think if you just look at that and put it side by side from what we did in February of 2021, they look different. They, they intentionally look different. They're talking to different audiences. Much of what had initially been in many of our guidance documents was the weeds of, well, what about this, and what about this, and what about this, which we kept being asked, but we can take that out and sort of not all of those need to be in a guidance document. They can be in frequently asked questions. So you can find your question and say, what if I want to visit grandma this weekend? When do I do my test? We don't have to sort of embed that in the guidance. So we've been doing a lot of that. I think from a communication standpoint, it's been, um, it's been interesting. Um, we have the health literacy challenge that you, that you noted. We also have the challenge, first of all, that we're making decisions in imperfect times, sometimes with imperfect data. Um, controversy is always great on the news. <laughs> and if we had a piece of guidance that had 12 really important areas of guidance, um, and, and one of these, there was really pretty uniform agreement on a lot of them, but one of the 12, we didn't have all the data and we had to land in a certain place. That's the one that makes the news. <laughs> and you can get really smart people who I very much respect on the pros and cons on that. And I could have fought on either side of those pros and cons, right? Because um, we didn't have enough data to inform it. But that's the one that, that is, and then of course, people say they're confused. And that makes sense that they'd be confused. Um, so how do you cr create a communication space where we can admit, you know, we didn't have all the information, we needed to make a decision because not making a decision is a decision in and of itself. And this is where we leaned for all these pros and cons. It's really tough. 
It's really <laughs> tough, yeah. Um, we're going to ask our audience to have a chance to come to the microphone in just a couple minutes. So think of your questions, and there will be one live mic here in the room. Um, Tom, do you want to chime yeah, back so in? Yeah, so I wanted to, you to ask before, what are some of the things that um, really stand out as part of the challenge? And it seems from the outside, and just want to check in with you, that the budget of CDC is a very yeah. difficult thing to run. There are <laughs> lines that are directed from Congress that go page after page after page. And my understanding is that you cannot move money yes. from one line to the next. So when you have a large unexpected crisis, you do not have a large sum of money to be able to deploy for that crisis. Is that true that, yes. still? And what would it take to change that? <laughs> Julie's laughing because she knows. She looks really <laughs> um, Yes, it is exactly true. And in fact, this is, this is, it really is a challenge. So, so early in COVID, when it became clear that we needed contact tracers, our best contact tra tracers are in our STI clinics. Um, but we had a line item budget for our STI clinics for those contact tracers and mobilizing them to do, and this is really what I'm talking about with like the core infrastructure. We need an investment in the core infrastructure. We need all, not all of it, but much of that budget to be in the people and the labs and the data so that those are all there with some of those line items because I believe in those line items. It's not that I don't want to have every single one of those line items that exist. They're critically important. But um, they lock us in in a way that does not allow us to be nimble. And so um, I, I, the, the, the words I use are disease agnostic resources so that Today, when we have a monkeypox challenge, we can borrow from COVID of yesterday if we need to. Um, and that's really, I mean, the permission and layers that we need to do in order to, be, to get, in order to be nimble um, for that is, is paralyzing in our ability to move forward. I think every CDC director who's ever looked at the CDC budget knows exactly what you are talking about. It is completely inflexible and you have really no authority to move money from one budget to another, maybe a smidgen, but yeah, nothing no, that can really um, support. So I, I, I wrote this word down, disease agnostic resources. <laughs> this will be something we want to make sure we include in our report, for sure. Sustainable disease agnostic resources. <laughs> Have we I said got it before? We got it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Carl. Thank you so much, Dr. Walensky, for being with us. I'm Carl Hoffman. I'm a member of the commission, and I run a global health nonprofit called PSI. Used to be in the State Department. Um, uh, let me just say at the outset, I think everyone here admires you. I'm not sure how many of us envy you, because <laughs> the job is really difficult for all the reasons that you've been talking about here. Let me take you back to your comments about the CDC's very impressive overseas work. Um, you know, uh, I, as an American, of course, I, I'm a beneficiary of what the CDC does domestically. And now I, I work and have worked in my previous life and interacted with CDC overseas and found that to be very rewarding as well. But it's a complicated thicket, right, of, of players and agencies just thinking about the U.S. government overseas mm -hmm. in terms of global health. Can you say a word about how the CDC and USAID and the State Department and other agencies, DOD for that matter, how you look at that as a collective, how, how you see your role in that, the agency's role in that collective U.S. government response overseas? Yeah, that's, it's a great question, and I, I'm actually glad I can answer it having come back from our, because I really do have a much better sense. It's one U.S. mission when we're abroad, right? It, it, we, we speak with one voice. It is one U.S. mission. So um, I see CDC's role there as critically important at, at the table, at the forefront. But um, much of that is technical expertise. Um, teaching to, to sort of, um, it's the, the old term, you know, teach somebody to fish rather than give them the fish, right? You, you want to make sure that you're providing the technical support, but also fostering in, towards independence. Um, and so that's a lot of what we do based, based on our infrastructure, the teaching, um, and, and it, as you say, you know, in some countries I've seen it where, um, you know, this 
region of the country was doing COVID vaccination was being done by aid. This region of the country was being done by CDC. Sometimes other, uh, in other places it's been, um, you know, we're all, doing, uh, we're all doing the entire country, but we're looking at different areas in which we're doing it. But laboratory system, it's much of the same. It's workforce, it's laboratory systems, setting up emergency operations centers, our field epidemiology training programs, FETP or FELTP, the La epidemiology and laboratory training programs, they're teaching the next generations in country. And so that I see is a very parallel role to what we're doing here, but really with one U.S. voice in country. Rich. Yeah, I'm uh, Rich Besser with the Robert Johnson Foundation, formerly with, with CDC. <laughs> um, Dr. Walensky, uh, I can't imagine what it was like uh, coming into CDC, running CDC in the midst of a, of a pandemic. Uh, you lifted up uh, a little while ago the the declaration you made of, of racism as a, a public health crisis and the ripple effect that had around the country with health departments. When I look at uh, what you laid out last week, you, you mentioned in there a health equity office. And I'm, I'm wondering what some of your thoughts are about what needs to change at CDC so that CDC is an agency that meets the needs of, of all Americans and that not only will the next pandemic not have a disparate impact based on race, but the everyday issues that people face will not uh, have such a disparate impact by race. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is clearly something, I, my work in HIV, something I have been passionate about and was actually really, as I mentioned, really mobilizing um, at a time when morale was really pretty low when I started to say, we're going to do something around health equity. Everybody was on board. And what happened was our different centers and divisions all came together and talked about everything that they were doing in health equity. It was one of those places where we were able to really break down silos and look at the intersection of all the important work that was being done. So this office will really raise that. It'll be an office that reports the director. Um, we really do want to raise up our key core capabilities. We talked about the, the um, lab and workforce and, and um, uh, data, but also our policy, our communications and equity is being a really key important one. Um, we've talked a lot about promoting a workforce that is um, as diverse as the communities that we serve. Um, we've talked about core, our core um, infrastructure and our core capabilities. And also, um, you know, one of the things that I did early on was charge the agency with proposals. Everybody put forward a proposal of how I, I I was really didn't want to document the problem anymore. We know that wherever you look, there's an equity problem. We knew with monkeypox vaccination, we never saw the data, but we knew as soon as we did, there was going to be an equity problem. So we have to document the problem. But in addition to documenting the problem, let's look at how we can implement solutions. And I charged every single center and division with putting forward proposals of how they could address equity. Folic acid in, in tribal nations. Um, there were, everybody came forward. And it was really mobilizing. And, you know, they have a year to sort of work on those proposals. We, um, in fact, we should be starting to see some of them. And not all of them will work, but some of them will actually work in different parts of the country, right? So, so that's a lot of the mobilizing work that we are doing. And I'm hoping we'll be setting an example for other health departments. You know, uh, you've been talking a lot about workforce, and we haven't really touched on the Commission Corps. Could you say a word about the Commission Corps and, and what you might imagine the future role of the Corps at the CDC might be? Yeah, I mean, the Corps has been key. Um, it has been, um, <laughs> the, from a deployment standpoint, um, much of the f folks in the Corps, we were saying, no, you can't take the Corps because we actually are deploying the Corps towards our own key missions um, through. So, you know, much of the Corps, of course, lies with, uh, the Corps does lie with the um, Assistant Secretary of Health and the Secretary's office. But I do believe one that is key and critically important. Other areas, though, that I do want to mention, bolstering up our EIS program, bolstering, um, looking at loan repayment, our, um, our AmeriCorps for public health um, program. So really spending, and then we, of course, have this incredible opportunity with $3.9 billion, $3 billion in workforce resources to the states. Um, so I, I think we need to invest in our public health workforce at the Commission Corps level, um, but also in many of these other areas. Jeff. Uh, thanks. I'm Jeff Sturchio. I'm a senior associate here at CSIS. 
you know, for the first 40 minutes of the 45 minutes of your discussion, we were talking about public health, but we didn't talk about the public at all. And I was glad to hear you talk toward the end about uh, the hard lessons that CDC learned about public communications uh, during the COVID pandemic. Recently, when Tony Fauci announced his retirement, we were all reminded that in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, one of the breakthroughs that happened was when Tony Fauci and others, it wasn't just Tony Fauci, began listening to AIDS activists and listening to what they were saying about the design of clinical trials and how community trials could be conducted and we could get data faster and things could really change. So I wonder if, just with that in mind, could you talk a little bit about what you're thinking about how to bring the community's voice more directly into the work that CDC does? Uh, because that's one of the ways you'll be able to really address the equity issues you were just talking about. But I'm just curious to know, you know if there are advisory groups, if there are ways that you could build on, on those kinds of models uh, to bring those voices more directly into, into your work. Yeah, that's actually a terrific question. In fact, it was um, in those moments where Tony <laughs> inspired me or when I was very early in my career. I will tell you just anecdotally that um, I had the great privilege of, of being on a White House call very early in the monkeypox um, pandemic or in the monkeypox outbreak, God forbid. <laughs> um, uh, where um, one of said advocates said, could you imagine if we had been on a White House call with CDC within a week of um, an outbreak that was affecting our community in 1981? So it, we, we um, and I have a phone call with community folks every week for exactly the reasons as you, as you note. Um, but I think one of the things that's really important here is m ensuring that co the community is part of our workforce. Um, we, we ha and it gets back to as diverse as the communities we serve. How do we know what, um, what will work in Dalton, Georgia's vaccine centers if we don't know what the community needs in that vaccine center? So we really do need, um, and we need to listen. There's no question that we need to listen, but we need to recruit people in health in all of those areas. That's what we've been doing globally. That's you know, what we do on the ground globally. Um, and then, of course, you know, I think we need to rely um, on community and also on our local jurisdictions to understand and recognize. One of the things that's been interesting as we've put forward guidance is to be able to articulate, you know, if somebody has a challenge with our guidance, our guidance has to be applicable in Manhattan and American Samoa and Cherokee Nation and Alaska. And so, you know, as we think about all of the areas that, that our guidance applies to, we need to understand what the communities in those areas need. Um, you know, as we talked about wastewater surveillance or even our COVID-19 community levels, we needed to recognize that we couldn't use wastewater surveillance because there is no surveillance in Alaska. So what is it that our communities need on the ground? And you're absolutely right. We have to listen to that. Public health only works. It can't work from above. We're not an empire. It has to work from the bottom up. Rochelle, oh, um, I, I really understand and agree with your premise that science needs to happen faster. And, and there are lots of you know, good science takes time. We all understand that. But at the same time, the, the processing of science and the communication of science is something that often can be sped up. But uh, I think most of us still believe that the real secret sauce of the CDC is its science. Mm -hmm. It's what goes on in the labs and what goes on across the entire agency and all of the different domains of public health. How is that science faring while we're all focused on infectious disease and, and the outbreaks? Are we doing okay in those other domains? Yeah, I do think we are. And I want to be very clear because I firmly believe in the peer review process. Um, every, I will say almost every paper that I've written, I think, got better because it went through the peer review process. And, and, and um, things that I hadn't considered were, were addressed through that process. So the, the statistics got better through the peer review process. I, so that is still happening, and it is still happening well, and I don't want to discount that because so much critical science is happening, formative science is happening at the CDC. They can't be mutually exclusive. But I do, you know, if I look back to, it, I think it was like July 24th, that was the day that I saw the data. It was a Friday afternoon from Barnstable County, Massachusetts, and it was very clear that people who were vaccinated were transmitting Delta. Um, that changed. We looked at those data on Friday afternoon. 
We corroborated it with data that were coming out of the UK over the weekend. We saw another outbreak that was happening in a correctional facility. We had three different places where we were seeing this and we needed to change the guidance before any paper was gonna get out. And that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make those data public so that when we change our guidance, people recognize these are the, this is the science around it and we're not gonna wait for peer review. That makes sense, makes sense. We have um, two people at the microphone. Can each of you ask your question and then we'll try to mm -hmm. um, summarize. Thank you. Hi, good to Hi. see you. Asaf Bitan, uh, Ariadne Labs, Harvard School of Public Health. You know, I think one of the surprising and, and positive upshots of what we've gone through in the pandemic is the realization that the health care system now sees itself a little bit more outside the four walls, um, sees itself as having perhaps a public health mandate. And so I'm wondering, as you're thinking about reforms in the CDC, beyond making these necessary data interconnections, which are so critical, what are other ways that you are thinking about connecting more that bridge that's so critical between formal health care and formal public health? Um, Do you want to just ask the yeah. second question because we want to make sure we get to both of them? <laughs> Caitlin Rivers, currently with Johns Hopkins, but was with the Center for Forecasting until just recently. I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about any changes you're considering to the way outbreak response is structured at CDC. Um, I'm thinking here specifically about the graduated response framework where the pathogen experts often have the, the first pass at a response and then as it rises in, in uh, scope, then more and more of the agency becomes involved. Are, are there any changes that you foresee there? Yeah, thank you. So maybe I'll, um, to your question, Caitlin, the, um, it's good to see you again. <laughs> um, we are looking at this because while we, we need some partnership between people who understand emergency response, which in and of itself is a specialty, right? And people who understand the specific, uh, yes? <laughs> the specific outbreak um, or the specific pathogen. And that partnership hasn't historically necessarily happened. Um, so we are raising our response, the, 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 um, the level of, our, of response within the OD um, and to um, the office of the director and to sort of have, and we're working on this now, so I don't, you know, we're, we're actively working on this, but we do need more training in responsive, in being, how to be a part of a response and different layers of the response in vaccine effectiveness, in how one um, would, would manage or would start or would deploy to a response. So we're actively working on that and then thinking about the structure that we need to have as we, as we move forward. That is actively happening. Um, with regard to healthcare, I think you're totally right. I think that um, one of the things I really worked hard to do when I was chief at Mass General was to say like, our STI clinic is run by the state. Why, why don't we talk to them very much? Um, and so like why, we need to have more fluid communication with our state labs, right? So we do need to foster these connections. I do think the pandemic has given this, us this opportunity. Even from a vaccine standpoint, we, or even a case, a case standpoint, if we had laboratory case reporting at CDC, but we didn't have comorbidity data that lied in the hospitals, then how could we look at how, you know, comorbidity, and how could we even examine that? If we had vaccine data that lied with the states, but, um, but comorbidities, or, you know, or hospitalization rates that were in the hospitals, we couldn't use, we couldn't connect the two. So one of the things that we're actively working on, and I'm working with ONC on this right now, is to say, once we get our pipes connected and we're working really hard to get our pipes connected, are they gonna connect with the EPICs and the Cerners of the world so that we can make sure all of those systems connect? And there are mechanisms by which that can happen. Um, and I do think healthcare is motivated to do it because again, bi-directional highways with our partners. Thank you for that. And I'm gonna let Tom round us out here. Great. But before I turn it over to you to close this out, I do want to thank you for sure for being here and for your leadership and your incredible service under some really challenging circumstances. But I also want to thank Steve Morrison, who's really the, um, the leader of our whole commission effort and who's so is genius at putting these things together. But also our commissioners who are here, the members of the work group, um, my co-chair, Susan Brooks, who's at preparing for her daughter's wedding, so she has a very legitimate reason for, for being here. And our production crew, in particular, Hansa Khan and Michaela Simeon, uh, thank you so much for your role and for the team that's been uh, managing this. So, Tom, let me let yeah, you I would just say close that, us out. Yeah, well, really appreciate, Rochelle, you doing this and kind of being here and 
and uh, open to this kind of forum. I think what I heard today was, were many of the very important changes that you're planning to make around data and culture and accountability and workforce and maybe some of the unsung capabilities at CDC which are, which are strong and need to be supported. And I think you also helped us understand the kinds of things that are going to be important in the ecosystem that surrounds CDC for you to be able to make the kinds of changes that you want to make. And so I think we want to be, as this commission, uh, as this larger community of public health, I think we want to be very supportive of what you're planning and really engage in that process of change in the time ahead. And um, I also think it's important, just since we're here talking about CDC, just to take a, a moment to thank uh, the workforce at CDC, who Absolutely. I think has been at work for two and a half years without a break and working weekends and nights and often at some personal uh, health risk. So it's, we, we want to thank CDC for all it's done since this pandemic got going and come back to thank you for leading it in a very challenging time. So thank you so much, Rochelle. Thank you very much.